So we're coming to James, the book of James, to learn the wisdom from above, that is wisdom from God himself. Last week we looked at James chapter 1, verses 17 through 21, and so today we're picking up at verse 22. If you want to turn there in your Bibles or in your Bible app, the wisdom that God has shared through James will prepare us how to live to glorify and enjoy God. So before we delve into the word, please pray with me. Our almighty and gracious Lord, we confess to you that we have not sought wisdom from you. We have not listened to your instruction or obeyed it. We have not been convicted by your correction. We have not loved you or our neighbors as we should. We have lived as though we mattered more than other people. We have even used your gracious promises of mercy and forgiveness as an excuse to disobey you. Father, we have abused your grace and we plead your forgiveness. For the sake of your Son suffering for us, have mercy on us. Stir up your Holy Spirit within us so that we may live our lives according to your will. May we humbly seek your wisdom from your words. May we let your scriptures, breathed out by your Holy Spirit, dwell in us, and may we dwell in them. Let us submit to your words to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to instruct us in righteousness, so that we may be equipped as your children for every good work. All of this we pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is your word become flesh. Amen. I heard a story recently about a preacher who had an unruly mop of hair. Now, I myself have not had that problem in over 20 years. And that poor preacher, when he got up every morning, he looked like he combed his hair with an egg beater. So his wife being a good wife, tried to help him out. Every morning she would come while he was getting ready and find the parts in his hair that wouldn't stay down and she would stick bobby pins and barrettes in them. And um, before he would go out the door, he would go to the mirror and he would see where she had placed the various hair clips and she would take them out one by one. He would take them out. One morning, though, this preacher had one patch of hair that just would not stay put. So he decided to keep a large silver barrette on the top of his head while he drove to his day's appointments because he told himself, you know, I'll just take this off, you know, before I get out of the car, everything will be fine. The problem is he forgot about the barrette. And, uh, on his way to the office, he went by the hospital to visit the lady from the church who was there having a procedure done. And then he went and had a staff meeting in his office. And then he went to go speak at a big event that evening. All day long, he went around with that big silver barrette in his hair, and no one was kind enough to tell this poor preacher about it. When he finally did make it home for a late dinner that his wife had to heat up for him, after a busy day, well, his wife took one and she gasped. And she said, what are you doing with that thing still in your hair? That poor, embarrassed preacher reviewed his day and realized that hundreds of people had seen him with that big, shiny barrette in his hair, and boy, was he embarrassed. What happened to our preacher friend? He'd looked in the mirror that morning. He'd seen what needed to be done, but he failed to do what that mirror told him he needed to do. And so he went around all day with that big, silly, shiny barrette in his hair. Because he didn't follow through on what the mirror revealed, our preacher with the unruly hair suffered some social embarrassment our reading from James today tells us that we will suffer a far greater disaster if we do not follow through with what our mirror reveals. And our mirror, according to 
book of James is the Word of God. Our mirror is the Word of God. Now, last week we heard James's instruction, because remember, we're picking right up where we left off last week. So we heard James's instruction to be quick to listen. Listen to just anything? No, be quick to listen to the Word of God. Because it's the true Word that can save us. Don't argue with the Word. Don't talk over the Word. Certainly don't add your own words to the Word. What does James say to do? Listen to it. And our reading today from James picked up on what we heard last week. What are you supposed to do once you've listened to God's Word? Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now you could translate that literally as become a doer of the Word. Now we see why it's so important to be quick to listen, slow, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, like James taught us last week. We can't become doers of the Word if we're not listening to the Word. If something in God's Word makes you angry, right? Slow to become angry? Well, you're not going to obey it. And if you're talking over God's Word, you're adding your own words to God's word. If you're not listening carefully, you're going to fail to keep it. You're not going to humbly submit to God because what you've done in that case is put yourself up on his throne. Romans 2 verse 13 tells us that it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law. When we listen deeply to God's word, when we meditate on it day and night, like the psalmist teaches us, when the Word of God is planted deep in us, it puts down deep roots and it begins to bear good fruit in our lives. On the other hand, James warns us that if we listen to God's Word in a careless or casual or shallow way, he says in verse 22, we only deceive ourselves. Now that word deceive can also be translated as to defraud or to cheat. James is saying we are cheating ourselves if we don't listen to the word and do what it says. We are cheating ourselves. We're going to miss out on blessings. Our listening obedience glorifies God and it enhances our enjoyment of God. I'm going to tell on myself, because I think, I believe it's a good thing for the preacher to show off his humanity sometimes to his parishioners. Elders don't get too nervous. It's not going to be anything bad. Too bad. When Megan sends me to the store, she will rattle off a list of things I need to get, and I'll even make a note of it on my phone. But sometimes, and y'all y'all know how this happens, when I'm when I'm supposed to be making the note, my mind is somewhere else. You know, um, or I, you know, or I've got the theme song to Full House stuck on repeat in my brain. You know, and the point is, is I forget something that she told me. Why? Because I wasn't listening well. Of course, then I end up missing out, or I have to turn right around and go back to the store because I forgot the carrots. And of course, Megan will ask me, weren't you listening? And of course, I have to admit, no, honey, I wasn't listening very well. And then she will say, well, were you thinking about 80s TV theme songs again? Yes. That happens more in my house than I care to admit. Here's the point. In that moment, for whatever reason, something trivial was more important in my mind than what my wife was telling me. I didn't fulfill my wife's instructions because I wasn't listening. So I not only cheated myself out of the carrots that I needed for the pot roast, I actually also missed out on an opportunity to be an attentive husband. 
serve my wife well. What's worse are the times um, that I forget something on the grocery list, but then I come home with a summer sausage and some horseradish that she didn't ask for. A lot of Christians, incidentally, do that with God's word too. It's another sermon for another day, but I'm just telling y'all, let's, let's watch out for that. Here's my point. When we don't follow through on God's instruction, we cheat ourselves. And that's what James is saying. Out of opportunities for blessing, for growth, and for having a more mature and enjoyable relationship with our Heavenly Father. But our humble and listening obedience glorifies God and increases our enjoyment of God. So don't just listen to the Word of God, James says. Do what it says. And this is where, right, this mirror thing comes in. This is where he uncovers the mirror for an object le lesson. Uh, God's word, James says, is the Christian's mirror. Verses 23 and 24. Because anyone who listens to the word of God but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. Or excuse me, and immediately forgets what he looks like. Just like a mirror shows you the condition of your body, God's word reveals the condition of our souls. And James warned us that we deceive ourselves when we hear God's word but don't follow through. We are like that preacher with the barrette in his hair. Going around thinking we're just fine and dandy, but we got to shiny badge of foolishness poking out of an unruly mop of hair, spiritually speaking. Now, there are three ways that God's Word acts as our mirror. First, the Word of God is a warning. It reveals that there are penalties for disobeying God's instructions. In this sense, the mirror reflects God's perfect holiness and justice and gives us even a glimpse into his wrath. We see God's own perfect standards reflected in the mirror of his word. And with them, with those perfect standards, we see the threat of judgment on all who disobey. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. And for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Romans 2, verse 8. When we gaze into the mirror of God's word, we see a God who tells us, who warns us, who sanctions us. If you obey my commands perfectly, you will have eternal life. But if you disobey, you will die eternally. In the mirror of the word, we see that not only does God, as the creator of all life, have every right to demand this of his creatures, it is only right for him to say this. I mean, after all, if you rebel against the one who is the very author and source of life itself, what else can follow but death? Right? You are, you are out on a limb, and you are sawing the limb off that you're sitting on. Now, here is a second way the Word of God is our mirror. It always, always, always accuses us of disobeying God. It reveals our sin to us. No one ever looks into the mirror of God's Word. No one ever looks at the law, and the law tells them, you know, you are doing a fine, fantastic job. You look great today. In the mirror of God's Word, not only do we see our sins reflected back at us, we see ourselves as sinners. The mirror reveals that there is no one righteous, not even one, Romans 3.10. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 
When we gaze deeply into the mirror of God's word, we find that we have continually, repeatedly, and carelessly broken all Ten Commandments for as long as we can remember. The mirror shows us the ugly truth about ourselves. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. What we see in the mirror of the Word will either send us into denial. You ever been in denial in front of the mirror? Oh, I, my skin isn't really that saggy. Well, you can't hardly tell I've gained all that weight. That mole certainly doesn't look cancerous. Okay, I hear. Yeah. <laughs> that last one was a little extreme. But the point is, is we, we say, you know, I'm a good person, God. Or, what we see in God's mirror, listen, will kill our pride and it will crush us. so that we throw ourselves on God's mercy and forgiveness because we realize there's no other way we're going to be saved. And that brings me to the third way that God's word serves as our mirror. It discloses God's promise of grace. We see in God's word the true reflection of our own condition. Disfigured and distorted by sin. But you know what we see even more clearly than that? Is the beauty of Christ. The beauty of Christ. You see, sin has made us all outlaws. We spend our lives running, looking back in our own rearview mirror, waiting for that inevitable day when God's judgment finally falls on us. But then we see Christ. We see Christ and we hear Him say, You do not have to run away anymore. He invites us to Himself. Come to Me, He says, all you who are weary and burdened, weary of running from the doom that we know that we cannot escape, burdened by the truth revealed in God's mirror, which is our sin and guilt. And Jesus says, come to Me, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. Whoever comes to me, he tells us, I will never, never drive away. John 6, 37. In the mirror of God's word, we see the gospel. We see Christ revealing, uh, fulfilling the law perfectly for us, perfectly obeying all of God's commands where we have failed. We see him willingly voluntarily go to the cross bearing our sin and guilt and judgment. The mirror reveals a God who no longer says to us, if you perfectly obey my instructions, you will live. He tells us, my son has perfectly obeyed all of my commandments for you. And what's more, perfectly satisfied my justice for your law breaking. Now believe in him and live. When you were not a Christian, God's word was a mirror that condemned you and drove you to Even when you've been a Christian for a very long time, you don't need to stop paying attention to the mirror. I think that's where people get in trouble. I know sometimes in my life I have. Once the law and the gospel have done their work, I don't pay as much attention to the mirror as I should. See, the mirror of God's word will continue to disclose your need for Christ. It will keep driving you back to Christ. See, where before it condemned you and it crushed you to kill your stubborn pride. Now, the more you gaze into it and meditate on what you see, the mirror of God's word will continue to correct you. 
and it will continue to instruct you. It will show you, spiritually speaking, the spinach in your teeth and all your split ends. And it will say, you really need to do something about those. But here's the thing, church. You don't floss your teeth don't condition your hair with the mirror. You see what I'm saying? You turn again to Christ for forgiveness and for healing. See, Christ has given you his own Holy Spirit, breathing Christ's own life through you so that you are not only convicted by the Word of God, now you remember God's law, you marinate in it, you delight in it, you act on it, and you persevere. In Christ, God has set you free from the burden and the condemnation of the law precisely so that you can know the freedom that comes from obeying. God's law. Let me unpack that. Let's go to James, verse 25. He says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We have not been set free from the law so that we can sin more. Instead, we have been set free from the guilt and the condemnation of sin so that now we can obey God without fear. James tells us to continue gazing into the mirror of God's Word. We shouldn't rush through our scripture reading, check off the box, and then run through the rest of our day forgetting what we have read. We also ought not to stay on the shallow end. Not in how we read the Bible or how we apply it in our lives. We need to let the Word work itself into the deep places. No, James says if we abide in the Word and we do what it says, what we do will be blessed. I love that James calls the commands and instructions that we find in Scripture. In verse 25, he calls them what? The perfect law that gives freedom. Now this is hard for Americans to stomach. Because we are libertarians by nurture. So when we hear that there's a perfect law that can give us freedom, a lot of us have a difficult time believing that. But James says that the scripture demands our attention. He tells us to look intently into it and do what it says. And he says that for two reasons. First, because it's perfect, right? And second, because it gives us freedom. Psalm 19, verse 7 tells us that the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. God's law is perfect because it reveals His perfect character. We just finished a series on the Ten Commandments. Now think about some of those commandments. God's law says, Thou shalt not murder. Well, God is the author of life. See how the commandment reveals God's character? God's law says, You shall not commit adultery. Well, God is always faithful to us. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. God's law says you shall not steal. Well, God is generous and gives us every good and perfect gift. God's law says you will not bear false witness. God's word is truth. And God always keeps his promises. So when we meditate on God's instructions and we seek to conform our lives to them, we learn to live and move in God's world by God's ways. Second, James says 
that the law of God gives us freedom. The psalmist said, we heard this, uh, Gavin read this in our readings today, Psalm 119.45, I will walk about in freedom. Why? Because I have sought out your precepts. Literally, it says, I will walk in a wide space because I have sought your precepts. Like I said, it's hard for us to equate law with freedom. I mean, after all, doesn't having to obey laws mean that we're less free? In a way, it does. Okay, When God tells me not to bear false witness, that means I am not free to say whatever I want whenever I want to. My speech must be more disciplined than if I weren't wanting to obey God. But that commandment also brings freedom, not just to me, but to others. Think about it like this. If a parent knows that their child is truthful, that gives the parent the freedom to trust their child. And parents, that's, that's, that's liberating, isn't it? But it also gives the child the freedom of being trusted. So when she says she's going to the park to play soccer with her friends and she'll be home in time for dinner, typically she's going to be free to do that without you know, the bother of her parents having to check in on her all the time. The law of God gives us freedom because humans thrive and flourish when we obey God's law. For example, there is great freedom in our marriages when we listen to God's law. It says, do not commit adultery, and we obey it. There's freedom in our marriages. The joyous freedom in a wife not having to ask her husband, do you still love me? The satisfying liberation for the husband who knows his wife will not abandon him. A faithful marriage gives both partners gives both partners the freedom they need to grow together knowing that they're not going to have to face life's challenges alone just before God spoke his law to his people at Mount Sinai you know what he told them he said I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. Exodus 20, verse 2. For redeemed people who know that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Right, we're not trying to keep the law to be saved. That changes everything. God's law now does bring freedom. It does not lead us back into slavery. James tells us that when we remember God's instructions, when we consider them, when we put them into practice, that God will bless what we do. The great blessing of real freedom, says James, is found in doing God's will, not just in knowing it. So church, with that in mind, here's our homework for this week. James 2.8, which we also heard today, he said that the royal law, right, that means this is the king of all the laws, right? The royal law found in scripture is love your neighbor as yourself. We heard that from Paul in our readings today too. Galatians 5.14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor. Did you guys know that you can't just decide on your own the best way to love your neighbor? My goodness, we would be in a mess if everybody just got to decide what loving your neighbor looked like, right? The law of God is what teaches us to love others as we should. So here's what I want us to do this week. Along with the bulletin this week, I sent out a document that has the final six of the Ten Commandments. Those are the laws that teach us how to love our neighbor.
Those are the commandments that are aimed at how we relate to each other. I also included with those little notes from our old Puritan friends at Westminster explaining very briefly what each commandment means and a few other scriptures to support it. So here's what I want us all to do this week. Let's just pick one, like literally just one of those commandments this week and really meditate on the commandment and its meaning. What you must do to fulfill it. What you must avoid to fulfill it. And then here's the really sticky part. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to act on that commandment this week. In other words, like James says, gaze into the mirror of God's word and then do what it says. But as you do, as you do, remember what else God's word tells you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 1. Along with the commandments, there is always the promise of grace for believers. Take comfort in those words because you will find that you often still fail to obey the Lord's commandments. Or when you're trying to obey that one commandment that you're focusing on this week, you'll realize that you have failed at another one. Now the word of God will still convict you of your sins, and actually that's a good thing because it means the Holy Spirit is making your heart more tender to the things of God. But the law no longer condemns believers. So when you do feel the sting of failure, do take heart. Do be encouraged. Christ already atoned for it on the cross. Now you are free to glorify God with your life and enjoy Him without fear now and forever.